For our reading of the Word of God, we turn to Deuteronomy chapter 1. Book of Deuteronomy chapter 1. The whole of the book is, well, it, the word, the, the name of the book means second law, and it's a recording uh, by Moses in the ears of all the people just before he goes up and is taken from them by death. He records the history and he repeats many of the laws. In this first chapter, he begins. We're going to start to read at verse 19. Verse 19 talks about when they left Sinai and the mount called Horeb where God spoke to the children of Israel and gave them the law. And when we departed from Horeb, we went through all that great and terrible wilderness which ye saw by the way of the mountain of the Amorites, as the Lord our God commanded us. And we came to Kadesh Barnea, that's on the very southern part of the land of Canaan, ready to enter in. And I said unto you, Ye are come unto the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God doth give unto us. Behold, the Lord thy God hath set the land before thee. Go up and possess it, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath said unto thee. Fear not, neither be discouraged. And ye came near unto me, every one of you, and said, We will send men before us, they will search us out the land and bring us word again by what way we may go up and into what cities we shall come. And the saying pleased me well, and I took twelve men of you, one of a tribe, and they turned and went up into the mountain and came into the valley of Eshcol and searched it out. And they took of the fruit of the land in their hands and brought it down unto us and brought us word again and said, it is a good land which the Lord our God hath given us. Notwithstanding, ye would not go up, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord your God. And ye murmured in your tents and said, Because the Lord hated us, he hath brought us forth out of the land of Egypt to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Whither shall we go up? Our brethren have discouraged our hearts, saying, the people is greater and taller than we. The cities are great and walled up to heaven. And moreover, we have seen the sons of the Anakims there. Then I said unto you, Dread not, neither be afraid of them. The Lord your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you according to all that he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where, you, where thou hast seen how that the Lord thy God bare thee as a man doth bear his son in all the way that he, he went until ye came unto this place. Yet in this thing ye did not believe the Lord your God who went in the way before you to search you out a place to pitch your tents in in fire by night to show you by what way ye should go and in a cloud by day. And the Lord heard the voice of your words and was wroth and swear, saying, Surely there shall not one of these men of this evil generation see that good land which I swear to give unto your fathers, save Caleb the son of Jephunneh, he, he hath shall see it, and to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon, and to his children, because he hath Holy followed the Lord. Also the Lord was angry with me for your sake, saying, Thou shalt not go into thither. For but Joshua the son of Nun, which standeth before thee, he shall go in thither. Encourage him, for he shall cause the Israel to inherit it. Moreover, your little ones, which ye said should be a prey, and your children, which in that day had no knowledge between good and evil, they shall go in thither, and unto them will I give it, and they shall possess it. But as for you, turn you and take your journey into the wilderness by the way of the Red Sea. Then ye answered and said unto me, We have sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight according to all that the Lord our God commanded us. 
And when ye had girded on every man his weapons of war, ye were ready to go up into the hill. And the Lord said unto me, Say unto them, Go not up, neither fight, for I am not among you, lest ye be smitten before your enemies. So I spake unto you, and ye would not hear, but rebelled against the commandment of the Lord, and went presumptuously up into the hill. And the Amorites, which dwelt in that mountain, came out against you, and chased you as bees do, and destroyed you in Seir, even unto Hormah. And ye returned and wept before the Lord. But the Lord would not hearken to your voice, nor give ear unto you. So ye abode in Kadesh many days, according unto the days that ye abode there. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Verse 36 is the text that God gives to us this morning. Verse 36, Deuteronomy 1. Save Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, he shall see it, and to him will I give the land that he hath trodden upon, and to his children, because he hath wholly followed the Lord. What a tremendous way to describe a child of God. Though he don't know it yet, it might be a beautiful thing to put on a gravestone. So significant is this expression that it's used four times with regard to Caleb. Twice in the book of Numbers, here in Deuteronomy, and again in Joshua 14. Joshua likes the expression as well. And he uses it twice to describe himself. Holy followed Jehovah. That's God's description of this man with this name. And our prayer is for ourselves, but also for this Caleb, that that may be an accurate description that God give him that faith that would be reflected in the actions and the positions that Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, took. He full wholly followed the Lord. We take that as our theme. We consider, first of all, the occasion. Secondly, we consider the activity of the faith of Caleb. And finally, the blessing that God promises to give to him here in our text. Twelve spies were sent out. In the book of Numbers, chapter 13, the sending of those spies was at the specific command of God. Deuteronomy 1 fills out the picture and fills it out by saying that it was, verse 22, at the request of the people. So the people requested it of Moses that they not just go into that land, the land of Canaan, but that they send out spies. God also commanded that those 12 spies be sent out to see what that land contained. We learn from the way in which the people responded here in verse 30 and 31 and again in verse 33 that they were characterized by unbelief. And we may then conclude that while God's purpose was great in sending out those spies, when the people, in verse 22, came near, every one of you, Moses says, to request that there be spies sent out, that that request arose out of fear, out of a sense of discouragement. They weren't ready to go forward. There was not faith being exercised by them at that time. Well, for 40 days, and that 40 is reflected in the punishment that God gave to them, one day, one year, for every day that the spies went through the land, 40 years they would wander in the wilderness. Because the report brought back was most factual, 
and accurate, truthful. The nations that occupied Lut and Canaan, it wasn't empty. It was full of people. And not only was it full of people, but they had built and established strong walled cities with solid bars and gates. And, and there were giants that occupied some of the places in the land of Canaan. It is obvious that the people were discouraged because they, having experienced God delivering them out of Egypt and the care that he had given them for the last year and a half in the land of, in the wilderness, that they might be able to just walk in and possess that land and occupy it. That they would not have to go through any efforts to be able to gain it. We might say it this way. While God says that you cannot see him without peace with all men and holiness, Hebrews 12, or to use Luke's words as he describes Paul's conclusion to that first missionary journey, without much affliction, we cannot enter into the kingdom. The people of Israel thought, let's go into Canaan and let's possess it without holiness and without having to suffer any kind of afflictions. Lord, make our path to heaven smooth. Without holiness and without affliction. God is showing that his sovereignty does not deny responsibility. He is Lord. And he's made promises. He's going to fulfill those promises. Promises are forgiveness and righteousness. Promises are glory in heaven. But the way to and the way in which God is going to fulfill those promises are through the exercise of the faith of his people. We must exercise faith. And what does faith do? We'll see that in what Caleb did. But they didn't want to exercise their faith in the difficulties that were required of them as the path that God had chosen for them to trod on their way to Canaan. So their conclusion, verse 26 of Deuteronomy 1 says, Ye would not go up, but rebel. Notice the strength of the language. Ye would not go up, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord your God. He had given a specific commandment. They rebelled against that commandment, and they refused to go up. In Numbers 13, verses 31 and 32, the men that went up with you said, We be not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land, which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants. And we were in their own sight, in our own sight, as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. They adored all the promises that God had given. And they took what they saw what they visually perceived and they made that more true than what God had promised. 
God may say this, but we saw. And this is what we concluded. That we are as grasshoppers. We're so tiny and insignificant over against those giants that occupy the land of Canaan. They drew their conclusion based on what they saw visually, physically. And then their fear, and this is what it always does, their fear aggravated. Their fear aggravated the situation and everything. So they exaggerated the heights of the walls up to heaven and the size of the giants. In our sight, we were as grasshoppers. We can't do it. And in doing that, they ignored what they had seen with their eyes and heard with their ears for the last one and a half years. They took a report brought within the space of a few hours or given within the space of a few hours and they ignored all the evidence of a last year and a half. What miracles God had used to give them birth out of the land of Canaan. How he had baptized them through the Red Sea destroying all their enemies. How that cloud led them day and night. How God himself addressed them from Sinai. All of that became in their minds as nothing in the light of what they heard from the ten spies. The activity of faith takes a different position. Caleb, with Joshua, saw everything that the other ten spies saw. But while their eyes perceived it, that which within them received that which they saw was the perception of faith. They never forgot Jehovah and Jehovah's attitude towards them. They never forgot Jehovah and Jehovah's attitude towards them. In the book of Numbers chapter 14 where this expression, holy followed Jehovah, is used for the first time, in verse 24, 1424, we read this. But my servant Caleb, because he had another spirit within him and hath followed me fully, him will I bring into the land wherein, whereinto he went, and his seed shall possess it. He had another spirit within him. That first, he had another spirit. It was a spirit that was different from the rest of the spies, except for Joshua, of course. His attitude, verse 30 of Numbers 14, was this. Let us go up. Let us go in. And let us take it. We can possess it. That's the way he reported it. Caleb stilled the people before Moses and the Lord and said, Let us go up at once and possess it. And then he added, for we are well able to overcome it. Let's go up. We are well able to overcome it. He made it simple. He kept it simple. And when our fears rise... And we are attended in, we are inclined to aggravate our fears and exaggerate our foes, make them as high as heaven and ourselves as small as grasshoppers. That's, that's when we lose sight of Jehovah. Kept it simple. 
Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. He didn't say it was going to be easy. But he kept it simple. And that simplicity was beautiful. King Hezekiah faced a situation very similar when Sennacherib and the Assyrians had destroyed nation after nation after nation coming ever nearer. Then they went to the ten tribes, the, the families of the people of Judah, and destroyed all of those ten tribes. And then they marched through the land of Judah, and they took city after city after city, and finally they came to Jerusalem, the only thing that was left. And they surrounded it with their armies, and they spoke blasphemously over the walls and the ears of all the people. Hezekiah spoke simple but powerful words to the people. He said, 2 Chronicles 32, verses 7 and 8, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed. For the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with them, with him. Listen. For there is more with us than with him. And that makes you hear the words of Elijah to his servant. Lord, open his eyes that he may see the chariots of fire all around that enemy that surrounds us. Then he, Hezekiah adds, with him is an arm of flesh, but with us is Jehovah, our God, to help us and to fight our battles. And the people responded with faith to Hezekiah. And the people rested, beautiful, beautiful idea. The people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. We're ready to pace. We're ready to walk about. We're ready to throw up our arms in despair. He that is for us is greater than those that are against us. Every day of your life, say that. And every time you're afraid, with us is Jehovah, our God. There may be power in cancer. The words of former friends may kill us inside. They may destroy our bodies and take our possessions. But this never changes. Jehovah, our God, is with us to help us and to fight our battles. Lay yourselves down in your beds and sit in your easy chairs. Rest in the thoughts of those words. And you won't be afraid. That's the way he gives his beloved sleep. Psalm 127. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord watch the city, the watchers watch in vain. But they know Jehovah does. You did nothing to form him. You can do nothing to keep him alive physically. You can't do hardly anything. If the Lord wants to take him, you nourish him, you feed him, you nurse him, you change him. But it's all the Lord. And the Lord your God, your God, is with you. Caleb had that spirit. That was the expression of faith. And that's why then next, in Numbers 14, 24... But here in, Josh, in, Ke in Deuteronomy 1, verse 36, it can be said, He wholly followed Jehovah. In the Hebrew, 
the idea is holy, completely, and the, the word in the Hebrew has filled. He was filled. That, that's the concept. He's filled up. Here we are, vessels. We feel empty. We feel that there's nothing for us. But he filled with this thought. He was going to follow after. He was going to go after Jehovah. Pray that for Caleb. Pray that for your children. Pray that for yourselves. That what, the, what you are going to be known for, what you want people to know about you, is that you fully followed Jehovah. That faith that enabled him to be able to say, sure, I saw the enemies. <laughs> they got walled cities that are strong. And there's giants. I'm not going to deny that. However, my faith sees something else. My faith sees the promises of God. That he would give them the land of Canaan. Give us the heavenly Canaan. And if the Lord is pleased that the way we must walk in order to get there is that we keep exercising our faith to do what God commands. Not follow what we feel, not follow what we think, but we're going to obey, obey, simply obey. Easily? No, but simply obey Him. Caleb purposed in his heart I'm going to follow Jehovah. I'm going to do and take whatever he gives. That's why the prayer for baptism included this. That Caleb would joyfully take up his cross. Because if Jehovah is going to give in his wisdom a difficulty, a problem of whatever sort, the cross that he gives us is not for us to kick it along and, and do everything we can to get rid of it or we're going to drag it and we're going to cry in self-pity because we've got to carry this burden through our life. No. No. Jehovah gave it. And he either will avert evil or he's going to turn it to our profit. And if this is what he wants me to have, then I'm going to take up that cross joyfully cheerfully. He was guided, Caleb was, by a conscious awe, conscious fear of God. And that conscious fear of God made him aware he is able to do exceeding abundantly. He's going to do things that are beyond my thinking. I can think of what this foe is going to do, but what Jehovah is able to do is beyond what I can conceive of. He took, he took the exercise of faith and he saw the relationship that Jehovah had established. We call that covenant. That established relationship was this. I am with you. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. My hand holds your hand. I am your shepherd. You can say, I shall not want. Not if Jehovah is my shepherd. In order to understand this position of, Josh, of Caleb and Joshua better, Remember, again, the setting in which it took place. The people heard the report of the ten spies. And then what they did was they spent one night screaming. Screaming. They spent a whole night gathering themselves together crying out in self-pity. 
All the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, They gathered themselves together. What one didn't think of, the other one did, as they talked. Look at the horrible situation we're in. Look what God has given to us to have to do. He laid this cross, this affliction, this burden on us. And in their unbelief and self-pity, self-pity, they made it only worse. They stirred each other up. They didn't believe God's word. That's Psalm 106, verse 24. They despised the land of Canaan. It's better for us to go back into Egypt, they concluded. He's going to, and then they said this. He's going to kill our wives and our little babies. He's going to leave them as helpless without us. And then they even blasphemed and they swore an oath. Would to God, they said, that we had died in the land of Egypt. And would God we had died in this wilderness. They were ready to take his name on their lips. But they did so in blasphemy. And they planned to choose someone else that would lead them back into the land of Egypt. Caleb, Joshua, Moses, and Aaron answered with faith. And that answer of faith is expressed here in De Deuteronomy 1 verse 30. Those first words. This is what always faith has to make us remember. Jehovah your God, which goeth before you, he shall fight for you. Jehovah your God, which goeth before you. He goeth with you, and he goeth before you. Don't fear. Be so aware of his presence that while your fears tell you one thing, your consciousness of his presence sets before you his will for you and his commandments. What is his will? It may be a loss by a team that we really favor. Or it may be a victory by a team that we really like and we're glad they beat that other team. It may be that we ran our hardest, we thought, and we look back and we learn we could have done better. It may be that we have a job. It may be that we don't have a job. It may be that we have to carry a cross that's really heavy. But as the recipients of grace, because if he's going to go with us and be be before us, then that's grace. Why would he go with us? You see, in order properly to understand that, you always have to start out with what that first teaching, the doctrinal part, the first doctrinal part of the form of baptism, that we are sinners. And our response to the knowledge of our own sins and weaknesses is that we loathe and humble ourselves before God. And that makes us aware, what do I deserve? Should I be free of afflictions? Should I be free of problems? Should I not have them? What do I deserve? I deserve hell. I deserve His wrath and anger. And if in his wisdom he is pleased to choose me as a recipient of his grace, and once he starts giving that grace, he will never finish giving that grace. And when that grace includes problems and crosses, and we have to walk in holiness and exercise ourselves diligently 
the muscle of faith that takes a hold of him and sees his presence that's greater than all our problems and all our crosses, then that's the way we're going to go. I'm going to follow Jehovah. That's what Caleb did. Now, did he do it perfectly? No, Moses didn't. Aaron didn't. Joshua didn't. We don't read of any sin of Caleb in the scriptures. But we know he, like them and like us, did not do it perfectly. But nevertheless, there was the purpose in his heart. And that's the key. There was the purpose of his heart. What are the fruits of election? Pointed out in the word of God. What are the fruits of those things that tell us about God's relationship to us? Godly sorrow. Hungering and thirsting after righteousness. Childlike all, all of God in faith in Christ. Perfect? No, no. Never perfect. Not on this earth. But they're present, and the presence of them is a gift. And then we purpose the good I would. I want to do. I might not do it, but the good I would. And the evil that I would not, I don't want to do. And I am resolved by the grace of God to do good and not to do evil. And that resolve may never leave us. That's the walk of holiness. Having been declared holy by God as the purpose of predestination and the effect of the cross, and he sees me as holy and righteous, then the child of God says, I'm going to strive. It is my purpose to follow him completely wherever he will have me go. His will I will seek to obey. That's Caleb. No Caleb that way. As an example, as one whom you want to emulate, being the recipient of only grace. God gave him a blessing. The setting for that blessing is this. God came and when the people responded to the repeated admonitions of Moses and Aaron, Joshua and Caleb, we can go forward, we can. And then they were going to take up stones to kill them. That's when God came in his glory. Numbers 14 tells us that. All the congregation bade stone them with stones. And the glory of Jehovah appeared in the tabernacle of the congregation before all the children of Israel. For God to show his glory was special occasions. The Shekinah glory was there at the dedication of the tabernacle. It was there at the dedication of the temple. Moses saw that glory in Exodus 33 and 34 when he wanted assurance that God would go before him and take the children of Israel because God was merciful and gracious and slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. When he saw that, okay, God did that now. Because he not only showed that what Caleb and Joshua had reported was correct and accurate, but God said, my glory is at stake. Because the key sin is not that they are not listening to Joshua and Caleb, but they are, and now listen to this, repeatedly expressed, they are not believing Jehovah. Three times in Hebrews 3 and 4, three times it's recorded they did not. It was unbelief. Unbelief. The last verse of chapter 3 and then verses 6 and 11 of chapter 4 of Hebrews. They would not go in because of their unbelief. So God says in all of his glory, I want you to know, it's not the cause of this man, Caleb and Joshua, but it's my glory that's at stake. They're not believing my words that I will go with them and I will give them this land that I swear to give to their fathers. 
And so God then said, this whole generation, and really generations, all of those aged and older ones, but also all of this generation, 20 years old and upward, are going to die here in this wilderness. One year for every day they spies went through, totaling 40. One and a half are complete, 38 and a half more years sitting in this wilderness. And I'm going to give you manna every day. I'm going to be good to you, even you reprobate unbelievers. I'm going to give you bread. That cloud is still going to be there to protect you from the bitter cold nights. I'm going to show you. You're not going to receive it as grace, but I'm going to increase your condemnation and your judgment. And the children that you said were going to be the victims of the Amorites. I'm going to so take care of them that I'm going to bring them into the land. So everybody 20 years old and upward is going to perish in the wilderness. Except, save, that's the words of our text begins, save Caleb and Joshua. They may enter. They may possess not just the earthly Canaan, but I'm going to open the doors to the heavenly Canaan. Not because of their faith, but in the way of their exercise of their faith. In the way of their exercising their faith, they're going to know that even when they face the last enemy and it's dark, they're going to see light. And death is going to crowd upon them and as it does throughout all the whole of the life of the people of God. But they're going to see light. Their faith is going to take hold of the attitude of God towards them. Amazing grace. And in that way, God opens for us the gates of heaven, the heavenly Canaan. But he also sets before us on an everyday basis. You wake up in the morning. What do you pray? What do you pray for your children? What do you pray for yourself? What do you want to characterize your life that day? May I be a Caleb, Lord. May there be within me a vision of thy glory, of thy promises, of thy strength and of thy might, of thy sovereign control of all things, so that I know thou wilt either avert it or use it for good. I'm going to put my hand in that hand. I'm going to rest assured that underneath me are those everlasting arms. And I'm going to resolve to go wherever he wants me to go. Lord, whither thou goest, I will go. Amen. Our Father, it's a delight and a joy to call thee Father because that immediately tells us the relationship that thou hast with us. And we honor thee by calling thee that as thou hast given to us the right and even the command to address thee that way. So now, as we see the life of a little child just beginning, a pilgrim path. Yet we know that it's thy grace that's ever present. And may we be resolved individually, having seen the washing away of our sins, to commit ourselves 
to following thee whithersoever thou wilt go. Thanks for that relationship of grace. In the name of the Savior we pray. Amen.